Genesis has become a brand name, but the band began three decades ago, and many gifted musicians contributed to its sound before moving on. Now, Genesis Archive, 1967 to 75, a box set covering the eight years that Peter Gabriel fronted the band, is reminding us all just how innovative and important early Genesis were. In the days of progressive rock, they were underground pioneers who propelled rock to explore its outer limits musically and as performance theater. The box set spans the very first demos the band ever made to rare live recordings, including their most ambitious concept, The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway. The box set, I think, was first talked about it two or three years ago, and uh, um, I don't, I've got no idea uh, why the timing, particularly now, but um, I was quite happy for some of the old stuff to, uh, to get out to, to fans. It was a chance to go through some of the um, sort of live bits and pieces that didn't exist, that haven't been out before, and that actually proved to be quite entertaining in the end. This is something that, that you know, you know, it's always been talked about doing the early stuff that's actually good. You know, we were a very good live band. So I think if you're, if you're a Genesis fan, there is a sort of collective interest there because all those old demos, which I'm, if you hear them, they're very rough. And I wonder who wants to hear them, actually. Genesis were all schoolboys together at Charterhouse Public School. When they started out, the band got a lot of stick for being posh pop stars, but in the swinging 60s, Charterhouse was a bastion of Victorian morality and imperial values. The fag system in the competing schoolhouses kept the youngest kids in their place, but the players in Genesis found escape and rebellion in music. I was banned from playing the guitar most of my career at Charterhouse, because um, it was a symbol of the revolution, you know, it was... Anarchy was about to fall on a school to be, you know, caused by pop music in those days. And uh, maybe that made me even keener. We were kind of up against it a bit. It was a bit, a bit like if anybody did badly in form order, they were pulled out of guitar for two weeks. So the backs were against the wall a bit. I mean, most, it's a stupid thing to look back at it. If only they'd realize psychology was wrong. I, mean, I had all this stuff from one of the sort of to the music masters saying it, one day you'll give up this nonsense and listen to serious music. Well, nothing is guaranteed to put you off the idea of listening to so-called serious music than that. So we became very militant, you know, even more determined, I think. Even within the cloistered walls of Charterhouse, something of the psychedelic 60s filtered in. Peter Gabriel would sneak off and hang out in London clubs and inevitably school groups formed. Basically, many years ago, there was sort of two bands started, Anthony Phillips and I, and Richard Raphael started a band called the Anon, which was Job, and the other kind of rival group was Pete and Tony. She also had Antin as well, so it was sort of a comical situation. And um, we started off doing cover versions, as you do, Stones and Beatles songs, and and then pretty early on, actually, and who really, I think, to be honest, was the driving force of all of us, um, got into writing songs. He said, "Listen, we must start writing our own songs." It hadn't really occurred to me, so we did. I mean, I could play a few Beatles songs, really, so that immediately meant I was the sort of number one. And I got together with a drummer called Rob Tyrrell and uh, dear old Rivers Joe, bassist. Um, and th then Mike Rutherford came in. In fact, he was a rhythm guitarist, as you probably know. He was a rhythm guitarist and singer, in fact. And that was it. I mean, I think it was just the fact that I was marginally better than one or two other guys that made me the sort of... You know, the, the better guy. Peter and I just used to play together at school, uh, mainly old soul music. And when um, Anton, one holiday's Anton and Mike decided they were going to make a, um, a tape of their songs. And um, Ant said, do you want to come along, you know? And so I said, okay, I'll come along. And I said, shall I bring Peter? Because, you know, we've got a song we'd quite like to do as well. And originally Ant was assuming he was going to sing his own songs. And, you know, he hasn't got the greatest voice in the world. But he started off and I, I did suggest after we'd done the first song uh, on that first demo tape that I thought Peter had a slightly better voice. And maybe it'd be good if he sang the other songs as well as the song that we were doing together, you know. We started writing songs um, and I would write with Tony and Mike and Ant were in another band so writing called the Anon and um, we'd get together for different sessions and uh, I think you know whenever you start playing music as a teenager you know you still stand in front of the mirror and imagine a huge audience or whatever you know all the fantasies are, are there. 
Sidestepping Charterhouse's many restrictions, Peter Gabriel began to develop into a school personality. All the boys who were keen on music used to rush to play the piano in the dining hall, but Gabriel used to get there first by crawling through the serving hatch. When it came to music, he was very serious. Peter was actually really quite... quite, um... He's a bit of an old woman in a way. I mean, it's, it's obviously very responsible, wanted to make sure his drums were all right, but he came along, you know, he was quite sort of gloomy countenance and very concerned that, you know, Rob didn't smash... And Rob's a very good drummer, very careful, didn't smash his drums. So my first image of him was, was nice, but a bit of a stick in the mud. He was quite large as well. Um, but gradually this sort of alter ego began to emerge, this character that would stand on the dining room table and sing songs when people play playing piano. After Baden Powell, the most famous Charterhouse old boy was pop picker Jonathan King. His chart success annoyed the teachers, but inspired the boys. I'd returned to my old school for Old Boys Day, and this young Sprout, who was probably there when I was there, but I'd never remember seeing him in my life, thrust this grubby tape into my hand. None of us had the courage to do it, so we had this friend called John Alexander, who was kind of a bit more kind of, well, he had a bit more spirit than perhaps the rest of us, and he, he just rushed up to him and charged and put it in his hand and said, listen to this. <laughs> Driving back home, I listened to it and I thought it was really good. There were some interesting songs and I loved the guy's voice, the lead vocalist's voice. So I called them up and said, what's the name of the band? And they said, well, we don't have one yet. His first suggestion was Gabriel's Angels, which I liked. But the rest of the band somehow seemed to miss. <laughs> some of the suggestions were very kind of uh, dodgy at the time, I think. Um, some embarrassing names. I said, one the Champagne Meadow or something. You know? Can you imagine it? Um, anyhow, um, it was 67, I told you. So he, he just suggested Genesis because it's nice and simple. And he thought, oh, sounds all right. So we put it out under the name Genesis and it kind of um, it stuck. I'd had a couple of hits as a producer. I produced a hit called It's Good News Week with a sort of a non band called Hedgehoppers Anonymous, anonymous quite rightly, that was a top three single in Britain. And so I'd had quite some success as a producer, but this was my first real project with a band who I thought would go on to bigger and better things. And it was the first time I'd worked with people who I thought were talented in their own right, as opposed to doing something of my own that I then sort of put session people around, basically. So I did regard it as the genesis of my production career and uh, it probably was basically one of the things I've been most I've been involved in that's been most successful. Energized by the support of their hero, a real professional, the Genesis schoolboys signed a publishing deal with King's Company and began enthusiastically songwriting and recording demos. That was uh, uh, a good, exciting moment, and um, in fact, then we started to send in demos which he was less impressed with and we wanted to get an album made and so I remember he was totally obsessed with the Bee Gees at the time. So um, uh, we tried to steer one with a slight Bee Gee tinge to it <laughs> uh, and sure enough he responded to that and uh, that is what got us uh, to make a first, our first album. Genesis's first single, Silent Sun, a pastiche of the Bee Gees sound, suited King's pop sensibility and created a bit of a stir. There was a stir in the drum department too. Genesis have had more drummers than you can shake a stick at, and the first of the many lineup changes came when drummer Chris Stewart was replaced by their friend, John Silver. We did a demo recording one day in Denmark Street somewhere, and then with sweaty palms and great deal of nervous anxiety, we were summoned into a record executive's office to be told whether the album was likely to be made or whether they were in fact going to ditch us. And they said, we really like it and we're going to go ahead with it. And so the big present for you all is you're going to get one more day to do the whole thing again in one day. The album I made, which is called From Genesis to Revelation, is still, I think, one of the great undiscovered albums of the 60s because it's got some super songs on it that will be hits today. I think it's important to remember that Jonathan was very important. He gave us a chance to indulge ourselves. In those days, to be age 16 and get a chance to make an album in the summer holidays was unusual. You know, going in the studio at our level of sort of uh, playing ability and our professionalism in many ways, um, no lack of enthusiasm, but to be like we were and to give him a chance to record an album was unusual. Still on that album, you see, we were really composers making an album. 
you know, we weren't really our playing. Tony was the most accomplished, but the playing was pretty naff in places. I made them do simple chords and simple arrangements and simple performances because they weren't that old. They were still 16, 17, or 15, 16, 17. But there's some terrific songs. The Silent Sun, I'm sure, is a smash today. When the Sour Turns to Sweet is also a smash today. There's some intelligent lyrics. Very young, very teenage, but great, marvellous stuff. Still now, I'm very proud of. King's concept for the album, the entire history of the universe on 12 vinyl inches, was ambitious stuff. Unfortunately, the album wound up selling just 650 copies. It didn't help that Genesis to Revelation was all too often filed in the religious section of record shops. In retrospect, a slow build-up to stardom was no bad thing, but at the time it was a disappointment that led to some soul-searching and eventually to Genesis and Jonathan King going their separate ways. We knew that if we wanted to do the kind of music we were in, interested in, um, that he wouldn't be right for us, because he wanted to simplify us all the time. He tried letting us have our head up to a point, doing this slightly more esoteric album. And then I think he sort of... Well, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure really what he thought, actually. One got the impression that he's lost interest, and I suppose you can't blame him, really. The guy's days at Charterhouse had ended, and it was a time for commitment. Drummer John Silver left and was replaced by John Mayhew, their first recruit from the ads at the back of Melody Maker, which were a crucial notice board for Musos. He impressed us because he was the only guy who could do this uh, ba -bum, ba -ba -ba -bum riff, which is what we really were looking for for a drummer to do, you know. They spent the autumn of 1969 playing their first gigs at youth clubs and colleges and then retreated to get it together in the country, writing their bolder second album, Trespass, in a cottage in Dorking. Now Genesis really began revving up. Their favourite venue was Friars in Aylesbury. This progressive club became a showcase for a whole new generation of bands who were breaking away from the Beatles, away from the hippie vibe of the 60s. Acts like Yes, ELP, Van de Graaff Generator and others of this new heavy generation were forging what began as art rock and grew into progressive rock. It's typified by long, complex, highly arranged numbers, introspective tracks to think to, not dance to. The first time we did Friars was at 71 or something. We, we were starting to kind of get to the stage where we would go to a place and you'd, you'd support some group and then you'd go back again as headliners. And the little pockets were picking up, you know. The, the Friars was one uh, place and the other Fox club in, in Southall was the other one that kind of uh, seemed to be those that particularly stick in the brain as being places we used to go back to and um, be very popular, you know, and it just sort of seemed to grow really and the Ellsbury crowd was just so enthusiastic, it just got sort of, it snowballed really. Like your first lover or something, it's something you remember well when someone actually likes what you're doing and responds very well to it. And although we'd, ha we'd had good gigs in other places, that was really the first place that adopted us. So. Um, yeah, I and mean, there's many good memories. There was a circuit in England you could play, um, which was the sort of progressive rock circuit. And uh, which was, you know, we used to follow all these people around, I suppose, well, loads of us doing it. And some, some sort of have proved to didn't last very long, and other ones have, have lasted a long time. And it was kind of mixed up with the blues boom at the period too. You know, you, you, it was sort of like progressive stroke blues was what all these clubs would call themselves. And, with a new professionalism and a proper record deal with manager Tony Stratton Smith's Charisma label, it seemed like Genesis were well set up. But the music they made was constantly exploring and asking questions, and so were the guys in the band. There would be many more changes before Genesis became the name everyone knows today. After the break, we'll see Genesis develop the unique sound and staging that has made them a legend. Genesis transformed themselves from an amateur group of public schoolboys into an experimental force leading the new progressive movement in rock between 1967 and 1970. But they still hadn't evolved their unique identity. It would take a few more lineup changes for Genesis to find their historic mix of musicians. The heavy touring schedule began to freak out Genesis founding member guitarist Anthony Phillips. Now he'd had enough. It was an unhappy time for me for all sorts of reasons. You know, in a sense it was a kind of um, a childhood, in some respects, it was a sort of childhood dream being smashed. Although the way I felt at the time, I was kind of relieved to get out. With Phillips gone, it was the end of the Chartered House era, and there was trouble in the rhythm section too. Drummer number three, John Mayhew, was out. I was the one who really made the suggestion that I think we had to 
get a better drummer because if we're going to start again, you know, we needed to get more strength in that area, particularly if we we're, we're going to have Ant, who was a very strong contributor um, to the writing of the group and everything. So that's when we auditioned really for both a drummer and a, a guitarist at the same time. Tony Stratton Smith, who was the boss of Charisma, I'd met him on, in previous bands at the famed Russell Hotel in Russell Square. And uh, I saw this advert at the back of Money to Make and thought, um, this is a job that I could uh, probably get without the audition, you know. So I went to the Marquee Club one night and saw Stratton, and I said, I hear there's a job going. This band had a square around the audition, which was very important at that time. And he said, oh, no, these guys are pretty fussy. You're going to have to go for the audition. So me and Ronnie went down to Chobham, which is Peter Gabriel's father's, mother's and father's house. And I went down there in Ronnie's car, and drums in the back and uh, Ronnie's guitar, because they were also looking for a guitar player. He always arrives early, unlike uh, many of the rest of us. And so he was there with his friend Ronnie about an hour early. So I took a swim in the pool, which was kind of, wow, people live like this. Um, and listened to all the other drummers, well, the three or four drummers ahead of me, you know, what they were doing. And it was kind of a set piece. What Gen The Genesis had, had found four or five pieces of music that kind of would show the drummer's versatility, you know, memory, you know. We wanted drummers who could play, you know, soft music as well as hard music and, and could sort of adjust and have sensitivity and all the rest of it. You can sometimes tell a good musician from the way they sit down at their instrument before they've played a note. Uh, and that was definitely the case with Phil. He had a confidence about him. But by the time I got to play, I knew it all anyway. I mean, I was pretty quick anyway, but I was, you know, I was really pretty, super slick that day because I'd heard all these other guys. So I went in there and pretty much waltzed through it. But I remember leaving the audition with Ronnie, who was also auditioned by Mike as a guitar player, and Ronnie said, I think you blew it there. I think you blew it. I think I did very well. And of course, you know, I got the job and he didn't. But um, the first thing we did, they went on holiday for two weeks. That's the first thing. So I, I um, actually, the only proper job I've ever done in my life was during those two weeks when I had to earn some money. So I did some exterior decorating, which I hated. Um, and then uh, they came back from holiday. We went to the Maltings in Farnham to rehearse and write. Um, rehearse some old stuff and write some new stuff, which was to become nursery crime. And during those rehearsals, uh, they would just flare up. I mean, I guess it was, you know, tensions were quite high. Um, and, you know, they just, Peter would have say something to Tony that I would miss, and suddenly Tony would be off. He'd, he'd walk out and he wouldn't come back for a few hours. And vice versa, and then Mike would get up and storm out, you know. And I'd be just sitting there with my sticks thinking, you know, what's going on? It was a very different sort of group to be in from the ones I'd been in before. But um, at the same time, the way they wrote was, was also very different. And, you know, it was very interesting. Um, it was all about the comp composition rather than the playing. And at that time, I, I, for me, it was always about the playing rather than the composition. So I kind of, we kind of met in the middle, you know, and I was class, I was kind of the joker of the, of the pack. I would enjoy his humor a lot, you know, I think we, when we did the um, dreaded uh, tour round promo tours, you know, if the two of us were working on stuff, then there was a lot more jokes. I mean, he had a real good sense of humor. He seemed more laid back, and I think it affected us, actually. He was a very important personality to bring into the band, but also I think it, it rubbed off on us, too. It's amazing how a bit of humor can divert a huge argument that's about to happen. Poor guy, I think he, he, he did hear originally that he kind of had, had got the gig because of his jokes, you know, so he was madly sort of you know, writing, trying to think of jokes all the time, every time he got in the van, so he'd have something to say. But, no, I mean, I think, you know, we, we, we'd had a sort of, we got a, there was always a good humour within the band, I think. There's no, never been a problem with that, I think. It's just the, it's that sort of, it was just, I think, good to have someone who was outside our, the sort of school kind of grouping. You know? I'd fitted in very easily, I thought. And, um, you know, gradually, very gradually, everybody loosened up. And I got more intense. <laughs> Playing as a four-piece, they began to develop material for nursery crime. Finally, Genesis found a guitarist who could replace Ant Phillips when Steve Hackett took over from temporary member Mick Barnard. Yet again, it was in the Melody Maker that Peter Gabriel spotted Hackett's ad, saying he was determined to strive beyond existent, stagnant musical forms. The new five-piece began writing together for nursery crime and going on the road. 
When I first joined the band, I, I, I cared about nothing else, really. I, mean, I didn't have time for girlfriends or anything. I just thought, basically, I've got to make this work. His first gig was City University, where I, I tried to test the rule about how many pints of Newcastle Brown you could drink <laughs> and still play the drums. And I proved that night that you shouldn't really drink Newcastle Brown in great quantities and then try and play the set because it was his first gig, poor guy. And I, I remember it, you know, and I, 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 you know, I've never done it since, I promise. And I was thrilled to be working with, um, um, well, with the guys and, and, and with uh, newly acquired equipment. I mean, I had a, a high watt stack for the first time and a brand new Les Paul. We just bought a, a Mellotron off King Crimson. Um, and that was it, was, it was great, you know. Genesis label Charisma had the bright idea of touring a package of their artists playing the university circuit with better transport and equipment this time. It was a crash course in intimacy for three musicians who'd grown up together and the two newer boys. It's funny, I mean, some bands are based on being mates, and that's what they're all about. Genesis has always been based on a musical situation that works. That's where it starts, and I think um, once that works, you find a way to get, get on as people. Some of these guys had known each other since they were about 11 years old, and so occasionally fights used to break out, and people would say, you swept my ruler back in 1963, you swine. What about my wine gums? And, uh, and so, that, yes, there was an agenda that, that went back uh, that far, but in, but in general, um, uh, the band was just more interested in, in, in working hard and saying goodbye at the end of the evening. Didn't tend to socialise very much in those days. Um, but um, it was great fun. The early 60s was, was very sort of, you know, you started pop music kind of developed. There was only kind of one level of pop music almost, you know, that, um, that, that kind of went up. And it got more and more adventurous in a sense with the Beatles and the Beach Boys and people like that and the Louvre and Pink, uh, Pink Floyd and Purple Harum of that period. And at a certain point, they sort of, they started to divide into two really. And you had the kind of, um, the simple stuff, which got simpler in the 70s and then you got the more complicated stuff which kind of got more complicated and we're obviously in that second strand really very much a sort of live um based thing you know you never got played on the radio really and um i think it was we were sort of like a definitely a cult group so you you attracted a following for that reason that you kind of like not everybody liked you which was a good thing genesis had started to stir up an almost messianic fervor that pushed peter to new performance heights he began to develop his very individual stage persona his visual creativity exploded over the band's next two albums, Nursery Crime and Foxtrot. Peter amazed the audience, and his fellow band members too, by bounding on stage in the red dress and Foxy's head illustrated on the album cover. I thought it was quite uh, useful in terms of uh, getting more of stories told, getting more sort of emotion, getting some strange strangeness in the performance, and I know there were certain uh, things, you know, which are um, seen as a source of a lot of amusement now, but with Watcher of the Skies and the bat wings, and I was wearing UV makeup and holding sort of UV tubes and things, and there were uh, things which at that time hadn't really been seen in a rock context. So there was a certain shock value, you know. It, it, it seems impossible to uh, uh, conceive that that, that would be uh, shocking now. But you know, walking on the stage in in Ireland into this old boxing ring in a red dress, uh, that again was something that um, provoked a good reaction. The other thing we discovered, obviously, was that as soon as when Pete put the uh, went on stage in Dublin with a uh, wearing a red dress and a fox's head, you know, that we ended up on the front page of Melody Maker. So this sort of said something to us, you know, because it's the first time we'd ever been noticed, you know. And uh, and I think that kind of one thing led to another, and it sort of brought out a natural... Because Pete is, is an introvert, really, and uh, it was a way of, you know, of appearing, I suppose. It's a way of getting over that stage problem. You go out there and you, you put on a costume and you, you act a part, and, and, uh, and it, it works. It's important to remember that in those days, PA systems are so lousy. No one heard a word that Peter sang most of the time. So, in a sense, he was trying to act out some of the characters. Uh, which suited 
the lyrical, getting the lyrics across, work with the music because it was quite dramatic in places, and develop into something that, that um, became quite a show. Open your eyes. It did change the way the music press perceived us. And um, because, you know, music is very hard to describe, but when you've got a picture, you know, and, and of course, what happened as a result of that was the fact that Peter became the focus of the band, which at first didn't, I didn't think too much about. I was just glad that we were all getting, getting somewhere, you know. But I think long term, we started to get a bit pissed off. But anyway, the costumes, they, made a big difference to our earnings. We went from three pound a week to 35 pound a week, you know, and six, you know, 60 quid a night to 600 quid a night. And things started to change um, quite, quite drastically at that point. Genesis broke through at home as Foxtrot went to number 12 in the charts. They were on a roll of growing international success compounded by the albums Genesis Live and the slick selling England by the pound. But the four-year run of work took its toll at the same time they were composing The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, the climax of the band's progression from art rock to prog rock. Though it's now regarded as a classic, the press had grown wary of concept albums. The Lamb caught the backlash even from within the band itself. Some of the costumes, I think, because this slipper man who was supposed to be sort of nastily contorted by sort of... Uh, you know, for all sorts of reasons. Um, there's sort of great growths all over it and everything like that. It looked great, you know, but the music was starting to become secondary, and I think that was, we realised we'd gone too far at that point, you know. Now, the Slipper Man was the, in some respects, the last straw, <laughs> the visual last straw. It wasn't just Gabriel's fellow musicians who were frustrated. He was realising that Genesis could not continue to function as the only vehicle for his ideas. I had been uh, contacted by uh, William Friedkin, who'd just done The Exorcist, which was a hot film at that time, and, you know, really well-made film. Um, and he had great ideas for sort of revolutionizing Hollywood and bringing in whole new teams of people who'd never worked in film before. And he wanted me in to do, um, to work on ideas, story ideas and visual ideas. And for me, that was um, really quite exciting. I mean, still to this day, something that I enjoy uh, doing. And of course, we dug our heels in and said, no, you either do that or you do this. Stupid, really. But we were too young and it was too early for people to have too many outside projects. It was not just personal projects, but personal life that made Peter want to withdraw from the band he'd helped to found as a schoolboy. It was the time of the birth of my first child and there was a really rough birth and the, the hospital didn't think she was going to make it. Um, and she spent the uh, first month in an incubator. Now, to me, this, there was no um, question of priorities, you know, the living being and a, and a record. And we were in the middle of making Lamb Lies Down. Uh, so I was spending a lot of time at the hospital. And, uh, uh, and I think they, uh, well, Phil had it. Uh, a kid, but the others really weren't appreciative of, you know, all that family side of things, which is, they now are. Um, and their lack of um, openness and, and uh, um, of understanding, I think, of, of that situation for me was, was a deciding factor as well. We co-founders of the band, if you like, as, as best friends, that's what we were, you know, so it kind of was a a great personal blow, but to be honest, we had sort of, I think, within the band, we weren't as close as we were because we used to fight too much, because we both cared too much, we're both very obstinate people. And um, that was perhaps, you know, there was a sort of inevitability about it. They then uh, sort of persuaded me to stay on, finish doing a tour, um, which would take us till the middle of 75. And I guess it was somewhere around summer, autumn, 74, then when I decided to uh, to quit. And um, that was very hard. You know, I think the band had just got too many 
sort of creative personalities in it and somebody had to go, really. And Peter was the only one who could go because the only one who really had an alternative career to go to. It was definitely the right thing for me to have done. And, uh, uh, you know, clearly it was good for them because it sort of brought Phil out front and gave everyone a bit more space, I think. Um, so, you know, I always look upon that time as a healthy part of growing up. The funny thing about change, you know, when Ant left and then when Peter left, you never look for change, but when it happens, it forces us to change. And something new happens, which is not a, I mean, looking on the bright side of things, that's a good thing when you're forced to sort of reappraise and to not get stuck in a sort of certain groove. Genesis went on to their greatest commercial success after Peter Gabriel left. The band stopped exploring the fusion of theatre and rock. That particular edge came from Gabriel alone. The archive box set is a time capsule of the formative years of a band that exploded from the underground to become one of rock's most enduring institutions. After the break, the founding members of Genesis reunite after many years to talk about the box set. Many bands last for three decades, and naturally Genesis members, current and ex, have become something of an extended, occasionally dysfunctional family. Putting together the archive box set was a labour of love that took years of emptying out attics in the members' houses and in the subconscious minds as well. Oh, so it's still a question of how, how much we can fit on, really. Because we've got to take off, in two order to put on one or two of these, we've got to take some off. The first two CDs are the li Lamb Live, then the third CD is more live stuff which is um, other songs that weren't um, recorded live with Peter singing. So we got particularly songs like uh, From Selling Them by the Pan, songs like Dancing with the Moon at Night. Also Supper's Ready, which uh, was the sort of what you might call the key track of the period, which we never had on record with, with Peter singing. Um, this is a version which was actually done on the Selling England tour, which again sounds, sounds, sounds really good, I think. There's a lot of stuff that people never heard before and really should never have heard ever. <laughs> Um, and then the fourth CD is, is the, arc, the real archive one, I suppose, which starts with something from that first tape we played to Jonathan King, um, which was sort of done in reverse chronology, actually, because the, so the sound quality kind of is a bit better at the front of the album. Uh, because that first tape, the only version I, I, the only version we could find was my version of it, which was a copy of, of a copy of a copy, I think. And I think it, I don't know if it was running or what it was running at. It was probably 15, 16, you know, so it's, it's pretty, pretty shaky. But it sounds quite nice in its own way, got character. But the... the other stuff on it were there's little bits and pieces which are demos of songs that have not been heard before by anybody and um, other demos of songs that have appeared elsewhere the reason for this whole box set actually we should say here is that um, for years you've been asked by people What's happened to that B-side that was released in that country, Please, not here? And one or two tracks that never came out at all. And there was always a pressure to do a kind of odds and sods album, you know, the B-sides and the stuff. And the reason we're against that, really, is that I think when those albums come out, they tend to be promoted as new albums. Or even if they're not, people imagine they're new albums. I thought that I only got about... I think 30 or 40 percent of what we did prior to this is prior to Genesis Revelation, so we're talking very early days here, uh, or prior to Trespass, anyhow. And um, I thought that I was under the impression that other people had some too. I'm sure Peter's got some stuck somewhere in some tuck box or something that he doesn't know about, you know, he's forgotten about. I think when I left, you know, I felt pretty guilty about everything. And, and one of the things that Tony took over was the uh, Guardian of the Tapes, but he's still convinced I kept a few behind, but I couldn't find, couldn't find them. Um, there may still be something somewhere. I think originally when we left, he denies this, of course. But uh, when we left, um, finally left John Joe, Jonathan King, um, we went into the offices and we took some tapes each. And I thought, you know, that we took a few each. But he seems to think I took all the ones that were there. In which case, the others are either lost or, or somewhere else. They're probably all rotting, but... Um, yeah, I think I found one, one thing which may have got used. And there, was a, there were a few tapes we were specifically looking for. One was at uh, John Silver's house in Oxford where we'd done this 20-minute, sort of the first 20-minute piece, which was called The Movement at that. And um, uh, it was all acoustic. And, and actually, I have good memories of that. And 
It's a, it's a shame we couldn't find that. I, I kept thinking, well, no, they, they'll have this. They'll have been through all this. And then this, this track started, and I thought, I don't remember this at all. This, what is this? And it sort of just begins to come back to you. And I remembered this track that, that you know, was one of the ones that was jettisoned from the album, probably because of my Iffy guitar playing. Um, and uh, yeah, these guys were sort of nearly wetting themselves, frankly. You know, these were devout fans, or if they could not believe it. So I sent the tape over to the others, expecting them to say, yeah, you know, got this, been through it. And, you know, and they said, no. It looks like they may well use that and a couple of the, perhaps a couple of the, the pre-string versions as well. So, extraordinary what you can find in your tap boxes. In a sense, the box set kills two birds with one stone. You get all that stuff out. And while you're, in, while you're in there looking at it, I mean, there's all this stuff from the past, the old demos. Um, so, in fact, you've got, as you probably know, four CDs of stuff that hasn't been released. OK, I mean, probably the bootlegs of, of Pete singing The Lamb, but nothing well worked and, and sort of mixed. Unknown in the band, or I was known in the band, as the archivist, you know, I, mean, I, I, would, I was the one that wrote down everything on the cassettes, just to rehearse, you know, taping all the rehearsals. And, and uh, there's a lovely quote that Mike made that when I left, what did, I, what did they miss most about me? And they said, well, the recording of the rehearsals. <laughs> you know, as if I was... It was very, I mean, it's actually true, I, I did that pretty good. But um, they asked me to look in the diaries, and I actually had in my 1970 diary, on August the 8th, I think it was, um, got Genesis' job, you know. And... Uh, so I gave them bits and pieces like that, some of which they may have used, some of which they haven't. Yeah, Purist may be startled that Peter Gabriel chose to re-record some of his vocals for the archive box set, including many parts of The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway. They found this old lamb tape, and I think lamb and supper's ready of the things I did with Genesis were things that I was most attached to, probably. Um, and there was, uh, when I heard it, I, I just thought the vocals sound like shit. And uh, part of it was just jumping around in the, in the mass. And uh, so I thought, well, if it's going to go out, I might as well try and uh, sing it as it was intended to be sung. The carpet. I think the first thing Pete realised when he left Genesis was he'd been singing too high for the previous ten years. Um, and his first album on his own was, was great, but you heard it, he sort of relaxed his voice and went for lower keys. Partly because I think singers, and Pete's guilty as, we, as all singers are, I think they, they try and push the top notes to feel they're getting it some energy. Um, and also partly because we as a band would never consider changing key. I don't know why, I mean, now I happily change key with the song to get it right for the voice, but in those days, it was, um, this is an example of us as, as intense young men. It was written in E, so I'm not gonna change it, it's in E. You sing it in E, you know? <laughs> we never considered ever changing the key because Pete couldn't reach the notes. Crazy, really. I remembered I used to have arguments with the band at the time about the pitching of certain things, which were pitched too high. Now, one of the things with aging is your voice drops, so you gain some low notes, but you lose uh, some highs, and so, things that were virtually impossible uh, or genuinely impossible at the time of first singing them were, were now even more so. So that uh, was, um, all the old frustrations came right back. <laughs> Why didn't the bastards uh, drop the track? And um, um, so that was interesting. It wasn't just Peter Gabriel who was prompted to remake the past when he had the recordings two decades on. Guitarist Steve Hackett also re-recorded some of his old parts. I had to curb the tendency to want to play, you know, a zillion miles faster. Because I, I, over the years, you, you develop technique. Um, and there, there can be, yeah, there can be a, a tendency to overuse uh, technique, which is something I'm currently trying to um, avoid as it happens. I think the 
Sam is a very strong album, and funnily enough, listening back to it recently, um, I heard it really for the first time last year when I was recording Mike and the Mechanics here, and in Studio Two, the little place, was the lamb blasting out, and I'd go in and Nick would play me bits, I'd listen to it, just to sort of okay it or comment on it. And then I'd go back into my st the main studio to do the Mechanics, and about halfway through, both doors were open, and you heard both albums, and it was like a sort of 25-year time warp. Or 20 years time. It was a very, very bizarre situation. Uh, but the Lamb impressed me. A, the diversity of music on it, and some of the jams and the moods, and actually the energy of a live version. I thought it really sounded good. It is a, a visit down memory lane. I mean, you know, you can... There are always traces of your own time. You know, you think you can recapture moments, but uh, you're always... You know, it's, it may look like a circle, but it's it's actually a spiral, and time has moved on. So, so I think there are unavoidably differences in the way one approaches things now than than then. Now, one thing also here in this this box set, I think one of the things this box set has actually reminded me, and I forget really, is how nice it is to hear Phil drumming again, because no offence ever to Chester Thompson or Bill Bruford who's done some of the touring. If there was only one drummer who plays those songs really right, and that, that's Phil. And Chester makes it work in his way very well. But when you hear parts of The Lamb, or other songs with Phil playing, it, you kind of go, oh yeah, that's just, you sort of remember how it always was, and how we kind of worked as a sort of rhythm section. It was, it was interesting hearing that. Assembling the Genesis Archive box set stirred memories of the closeness that growing up together has given the band. That nostalgia naturally raises the question, would the classic Lamb Lies Down on Broadway lineup get together again, even for one special concert? You know, I think this is as far as I'm going to go probably on, on this, but I mean, it, it was quite fun, but you know, it took me about 12 years to get out of being ex-Genesis, and uh, so I don't particularly want to um, slide back in. Uh, but at the same time, I'm sort of much more emotionally detached than I was, so um, I think I can enjoy it in the same way. You know, it's like an old uh, reunion with childhood friends, that sort of thing. So that it has a different feeling now than all this sort of gloomy personal politics that were going on at the time. I mean, relearning all those songs. I don't know if I can play that fast anymore, you know. Um, no, it's, uh, well, Peter can't get the high notes anymore. As I said before, we could lower some of the keys, I suppose. It's, I don't have any particular desire to do it. Thinking about it again, just that I think I've thought more about uh, Peter, especially, and Steve, doing this, which has been quite interesting. Oh, I'd say yes. If I can play drums, yeah. I'm not interested in singing. Always magic. 